This is Parents for Class Number 71, and today we're looking at the effects of golf ball dimples on its aerodynamics. And this is an idea that I got inspired by one of your amigos called Cube Techie. So thanks for the idea. So when you're looking at a bunch of different golf balls, I think there are 12 different types in total. And we're going to look through this paper called Aerodynamics of Golf Balls in Still Air. So this not only has the aerodynamics of golf balls part, but then the still air part, which we'll go through why that is important, because often when we do tests on on objects we usually put it in a wind tunnel and we don't really consider the effects that the wind tunnel has on the object but this paper looked into that a little bit and how the still air um, does change the flow physics and uh, like the actual setup compared to like real life compared to a golf ball to compared to a wind tunnel compared to still air so this is open access and you can get it in the link in the description so let's start golf is one of the world's most popular sports golf ball aerodynamics have been studied for over a century which i didn't know I've been playing golf for quite a while and I'm pretty decent. You know, some people have said that I'm the Australian Tiger Woods. Others have said that I'm the American Greg Norman. I'll let you decide which one it is. So the first controlled experiments were collected in 1940 or the 1940s with the advancement of wind tunnel technology. So over a hundred years have been going into golf ball dimple uh, design. And in fact, actually historically back like hundreds of years ago when golf was still was uh, first originating and being played, they played with like these, little leather sacks of, I don't know, whatever it was in nothing, maybe sawdust or something. I don't really exactly know, but there was like a leather outside and it was often not even uh, uh, spherical. It was like squashed from playing over time. So they were really dodgy and then they became much better with modern golf balls. So for balls with spin, it is convenient to describe the ratio of the angular velocity to the linear velocity by the non-dimensional spin factor S defined by S equals the angular velocity times by the ball radius divided by the velocity, the, the um, translational velocity. And spin is a massive part of the game of golf because depending on what shot you want to play, you can put a lot of spin onto it or not much spin. And depending on what spin you put onto it, you can get the ball to um, really float a lot. Like it, it descends very slowly. For example, something called a flop shot, which is what you'd play when you're very close to the green. Uh, that often gets a lot of air and you have a lot of spin on it. And then putting certain spin on it, you can get the ball to move in the air and also when it hits the ground it will also spin to whichever point you want it to spin the better you are the better you can do it so the amount of spin that you put on the ball really depends on the shot that you're playing a drive which is what they're going to be looking here that's when you're trying to hit the ball the furthest possible and generally speaking you don't want to put that much spin on the ball in one of these situations because that will typically reduce the distance that you can go um, just through experience, that's what we will learn. But in certain circumstances, you might want to put a little bit of spin in certain ways to move it around trees, perhaps, or whatever you want to do. So aerodynamics of golf balls have been studied in wind tunnels where a ball is held stationary in moving air. So a bunch of people, they've done some research onto it and they've conducted um, these studies in wind tunnels. Wind tunnels are known for good control over airspeed and ball orientation, but have difficult difficulty supporting the ball and adding ball rotation. Wind tunnels uh, correct for blockage effects using empirical factors and use scaled ball models to study high Reynolds number regimes. So that's the two major problems with this. First, wind tunnel blockage corrections are never actually accurate. They're always like a band-aid to fix the underlying problem and the underlying problem never gets fixed because wind tunnel correction factors is like when you have a force, let's say you have a force of five newtons, you then have an empirical formula that you put it through and you say, okay, well, based on the amount of um, cross-sectional area this this object takes up, we should add an additional 5% to the drag or whatever it is. And so you might get a fairly accurate um, force, but uh, the reason for that force, the flow physics behind it, is still completely wrong. And... Um, also, you may not even get an accurate force because as we'll see later, and as you see in lots of different things, for example, in actually the FIFA World Cup is on now. So this is a, a good time to look at one of our early podcasts where we looked at the, it's like podcast number four or something where we looked at soccer ball aerodynamics or football aerodynamics where you are in the world. And they experienced something called a drag crisis. And the exact same thing happens with golf balls where once you get to a certain Reynolds number, the flow physics changes dramatically. And that's usually because you get a change in the um in the boundary layer so it goes from lambda to turbulent or vice versa and then that changes how the flow separates from the ball and dramatically changes the drag coefficient and the lift coefficient 
So by using empirical factors to correct for blockage ratios, you're ignoring all that and you don't really have a good result. It's um, really not trustworthy. So that's why we want to keep the uh, blockage ratio very low. And one reason why they use scaled ball models. However, that changes um, like with golf balls where you have dimples that the Reynolds number and the uh, flow physics are very sensitive to all these different parameters. And so it's unlikely that you're going to be getting very true results. And they say here, scaled models may not represent production balls since the surface of golf balls are sensitive to dimple shape and surface roughness. The disparity between wind tunnel and playing conditions have caused some to question the results of wind tunnel measurements. So this is where are wind tunnel um, results that accurate in this particular circumstance? And there's a good argument to say, no, it's not. This not only implies that, this is not to imply that wind tunnel measurements are incorrect, but that stunning sports balls in an environment similar to playing may achieve results more sensitive to the sport. So in other words, yeah, wind tunnel results are incorrect. I mean, that's what they're saying here. They may say that it's not, but I don't really see the alternative to the meaning of what they're saying. So another thing we should talk about is golf balls in terms of their construction. So here they've said that a bunch of different golf balls, they may not um, have different, they may not have the same dimple shape when you test them in a wind tunnel with a model of this. And that's true. So different golf balls have different dimple patterns. And some of the golf balls, like the really good ones, they're even patented, the dimple patterns. So if you have another golf ball that comes along and they try to copy that, then they can file a lawsuit, which actually is, what happened and we'll cover that in a second so where wind tunnels measure resultant forces on the ball still air experiments measure the speed and position of the ball many have adopted high resolution sen speed sensors to find the lift and drag of sports balls in still air the usga which is the golf association of the us has adopted similar methods using numer numerous speed sensors strategically placed over long distances to the author's no knowledge no academic study has analyzed commercially available golf balls in still air at sports like speeds up to 90 meters per second and spin rates applicable in the actual game. So 90 meters per second is really fast. That's actually starting to get to the rule of thumb where if you go above a Mach number of 0 0.3, then the, flow is then the flow is compressible. So it's starting to reach that point, which is very fast. So this study that they looked into considered the effect of speed, spin, and ball model on the drag and lift coefficients. Measurements were made in a lift in a still air laboratory setting at speeds comparable to game conditions. So production golf balls were selected based on popularity, i.e. cost codes Kirkland, Kirkland signature, which I've never heard of, and market share Titleist Pro V1, which is like the gold standard. And it's been like that for, I don't know, 20 years or something, even more maybe. So the combined effect of lift and drag was considered by calculating carry distances for a driver shot comparable to playing conditions. So this is really what it, um, golf is all about in terms of the drive. So the drive is the very first shot that you typically take on a long hole, on a long uh, hole we call it. So one hole is the one stretch from where you hit the ball from, and then you have the hole at the end with the flag and you try to get the ball into there. If the if that hole is long, so let's say 300 yards or something like that, or 400 yards or more, you will use a driver as your first shot, and that will get you the furthest distance out of any club in your bag. The ball will also travel the fastest off the, the driver compared to any other club. So this is the um, club that you want to get the most distance off, whereas other clubs, you may want to take advantage of spin to um, control the ball and get it closer to the hole that way. But for driving, this is what we're all about, length distance matters so the method that they used so this study considered 13 different models of golf balls and the balls were cho chosen based on popularity to the market so to understand performance variations within one maker the least and most expensive ex models of the golf ball were chosen so for titleist callaway and TaylorMade, these three are massive um, brands the study was in part motivated by the low cost kirkland ball which many claimed claim performed similar to balls at higher cost. Due to its popularity and a lawsuit, production was disrupted between 2016 and 2017. And the 2016 and 2017 models of the Kirkland ball were therefore compared to consider consistency year to year. General information for these balls are given in table one. So let's look at table one here. So there are 13 different balls here, plus the additional Kirkland ball from the year before, so 14 in total. And they have a really good smattering of um, 
popularity, so Callaways. I typically use Callaway. I like the Chrome Soft for some reason. Pro V1s for Titleist and then TaylorMade's, Bridgestone, Shrixon, Wilson, Noodle, Nike, and Kirkland. My preference is the Callaway Chrome Soft for some reason. It just feels quite nice to me. Titleist Pro V1s are okay, but I think that they're overrated. Um, unless you're a pro, perhaps you might be able to get um, very good performance out of it, but anyone who's less than immortal uh, probably won't notice too much of a difference. So a bespoke non-wheeled pitching machine was used to project the golf wet the target speed and spin rate without damaging the, or disrupting the surface of the golf ball. So they have a picture here of this setup. It's effectively um, like just this hand, like this, this um, I don't know, like this U-shape of, object with a ball in there and then on one side of the u-shape on the inside they have high friction tape on the lower side they have low friction tape then they accelerate this u-shape thing with the ball in there really fast just to throw it out and the difference in the friction of the tape causes the ball to spin so that's a really good idea so i'm thinking out of the box and they say balls are projected at play conditions with speeds ranging from 18 meters per second to 91 meters per second and spins ranging from 15 RPM, 1500 RPM to 4,500 RPM. So they're approximately representative of real life conditions when you play. So sensors measured speed from successive pairs of light gates. The distance D between the second and third speed sensors varied between 3.18 meters and 5.08 meters. And the reason why this is all important is because of how they calculate the drag. So let's talk about that. Sensors were placed to maximize the distance between them while minimizing the change in trajectory angle. The vertical component of velocity was 1.34 meters per second or less with respect to the horizontal plane. The ball's vertical location was measured at each speed sensor and used to calculate the lift force. A high-speed video camera, a Phantom V711, which is a really nice camera, was used to record each shot to verify spin. So the drag force was found from a certain equation. So we all, like, most of us, when we look at the drag force, we say, okay, drag equals half M, uh, half rho v squared SC, SCD. So half times the density times by velocity squared times the um, characteristic area times the drag coefficient. However, they do a much more uh, fundamental analysis here, which is really cool that this stood out to me. So they looked at it from just Newton's second law, F equals MA. So they know, they want to know what the drag force is, which is F. They know what the mass of the ball is. And now to find the acceleration, they then, obviously acceleration is the change in uh, velocity divided by time. However, they don't know the time. So they substituted the distance in and then they made a really nice simple equation, which is the drag force equals the mass. And then in, in brackets, the second velocity squared minus the first velocity squared, so that difference, divided by two times the distance. So I thought that was pretty neat. I don't really see this um, variation of the drag force equation too often, but it's really cool. So I thought I'd share that. And they also have the lift force um, equation, but I won't go into that because it's a little bit more um, in-depth for me to ex like explain just through words. You might want to look at the paper to get this equation. But that's a cool um, way that they did it too. They used a, a constant um, acceleration uh, equation to find the lift force. Now, they have, they have graphs showing the coefficient of the drag as a function of the Reynolds number for non-rotating balls, and also the drag coefficient and it empirical fits for the Kirkland with spin. So remember that ball that was performing, performing very well, but then they had to stop it because it, was, um, it had a lawsuit against it, and it was a very cheap ball. It probably just got a lawsuit because it was just so good. I don't know. I don't know whether it was um, that Kirkland infringed upon some intellectual property or whether it was just too good. So they came up with a phony uh, lawsuit against it or whatever. I'm not going to talk about that because I don't know. Anyway, error bars indicate the standard deviation of data, which is good because standard deviations and error bars are rare on aerodynamic experimental data and we should have it more. So let's look at the Reynolds number and the drag coefficient with different Reynolds numbers. First of all, they have the drag coefficient of a smooth ball. And interestingly, Compared to a golf ball, pretty much every golf ball that they tested cut the drag by about 60% uh, just with the dimples compared to the smooth ball. So the smooth ball had a drag coefficient of about 0 0.5. However, at the same Reynolds numbers, so about um, 100,000 upwards, the golf balls with dimples, their drag coefficients were only 0 0.2, which is really good for a spherical object. So that's how good dimples are reducing the drag. 
And the main reason why that is is because um, it really cuts down on the vortex shedding off of it and um, it also roughs, roughens the boundary layer so that the, the flow can stay attached longer. At low Reynolds numbers, the balls uh, with the golf balls, with the dimples, they don't perform that well. They still have a drag coefficient of about 0 0.5. So it means that you need to go to a certain Reynolds number to get this positive effect of reducing the drag. And that's probably because at low Reynolds numbers, the roughening of the surface to increase the um, turbulence in the boundary layer isn't enough to trigger um, the translational, uh, the translation to a uh, transition, sorry, to turbulent boundary layers yet. So you need to go to a higher number to facilitate that. So that's interesting to note. Also interesting to note is that most of the golf balls perform fairly well. I mean, there is some variation between each one, but generally speaking, they do all have a similar drag coefficient, maybe within. Um, 10% of each other. So they say a smooth sphere was included in the study. Since its drag is well characterized, we all know what it is, 0 0.5. And it was projected between 90,000 rows number and 120,000 rows number. And they said that the drag coefficient that they got from the smooth sphere agrees well with um, literature, what we know. So let's go on to other results. For each model, two balls were selected. Each ball was used to collect three shots at each speed. And the drag and lift coefficients were calculated from the average of six shots. So now we talk about something called a drag crisis. And crises are very common in aerodynamics. In fact, it seems like most aerodynamicists are not happy unless there's a good crisis going on. And a crisis, <laughs> when you hear it in aerodynamic talk, it usually refers to a point where the aerodynamics changes dramatically. And that's usually due to, a, a fun, it's a function of the Reynolds number. So as I mentioned above, when we were at low runs numbers, the golf balls didn't really perform very well. They, were, they had a drag coefficient of 0 0.5. As we increase the Reynolds number a little bit, so we double it from 50,000 to 100,000, the drag drops by 60%. So that indicates a massive drop over a fairly short, um, a very small Reynolds number change. So that uh, constitutes a crisis. And again, actually the podcast that I did on soccer balls, there was also a drag crisis there. So we do see crises a lot, and um, I don't know why they call them crises too much. It seems melodramatic, but let's just call them a, a qualm. So a drag qualm, um, and uh, so this happens with golf balls as well. You need to get to a certain Reynolds number to take advantage of the dimples. So for the drag, non-rotating projectiles. For non-spinning balls, the average drag coefficient was near 0 0.5 at low speeds, as we mentioned, and close to 0 0.2 at higher speeds. And the largest difference in the drag coefficient between the balls were observed at low speeds, so Reynolds numbers below 75,000. Above that, they all became fairly normalized. So what this means is that the dimple pattern changes how effective these dimples uh, are at the low Reynolds numbers. So if you want to get a more turbulent boundary layer to keep the flow attached longer, you need to have a certain dimple pattern, which makes sense. What the exact dimple pattern is, uh, is a mystery because most of these dimple patterns are patented. So considering the lift now for rotating golf balls, the lift coefficient is expressed as a function of the spin factor in figure 4a. So let's look at this. To avoid the influence of the reverse, reverse Magnus effect at low speeds, the balls were projected from 32 meters per second to 91 meters per second with spin from 1500 RPM to 4500 RPM. And what we find here is regardless of the golf ball, as the spin factor increases to so the backspin, the lift coefficient increases, so that makes sense. Anyone who's played golf knows, like as I mentioned at the start of the podcast, if you play something called a flop shot, which is when you're close to the green, you put a lot of backspin on the ball. It seems to just float in the air for a very long time, and it gets to the point where like when it's coming down, because when you hit the ball up, it reaches the apex, and as it falls down, it um, increases in velocity down like its full rate, and because of gravity, obviously. And when it gets close to the ground, it seems to almost hover there for like, it really hangs in the air as it gets close to the ground because the ball is traveling faster. Um, it doesn't really make too much sense when I explain it like that, but anyone who's played a flop shot knows what I mean. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> all the golf balls perform fairly similarly in terms of the lift coefficient at high spin rates. At lower spin rates, certain ones perform better. So the Nike, sorry, the, um, yeah, the Nike and the Kirkland seem to perform very well in terms of their lift coefficient. The let's look at the Pro V ones. I can't really see too many because they're all clumped together, but they all seem to be fairly well um, similar to each other. The Callaway seem the Callaway seem to be a little bit worse in terms of the um, lift coefficient, 
but overall they're pretty decent. And interestingly, as the spin rate and the coefficient are fairly linear. So if you double the spin rate, the coefficient sort of doubles as well. It starts at about 0.1, the lift coefficient at a spin rate of about 0.035 perhaps. When you get to a spin rate of 0.2, the lift coefficient is about 0.27. So there's a linear relationship there and then it sort of plateaus off a little bit. So finally, the golf ball trajectory simulation, this is what we all really care about, how far can the golf ball be hit? So the carry distance was measured from the start position until the ball returned to zero elevation. As shown in figure five, so let's look at figure five here, the difference between the longest and shortest carry distance was 18 meters with the Bridgestone and Kirkland from 2017, traveling the farthest within 0.5 meters of each other. The trajectory of four representative models as shown in figure six. And we'll look at that in a sec. So looking at the carry distance of each of the balls. So in golf, there are two parts to a ball's flight. There's the carry, which is when the ball is in the air and then it hits the ground on the first bounce. Then there's the roll. So after that, once it hits the ground, then it'll start rolling however many more meters. And for this, what they found was that the Bridgestone, effectively the cheaper golf balls, like Bridgestone is a cheap one, Kirkland, both of them are very cheap. They perform the best. Then the Pro V1X, performed next best, but that was five meters of a, a shorter carry distance. So the Bridgestone and Kirkland got around 268 meters of carry. The Pro V1X was only 263. Then we have the TaylorMade TP5X, which gave a similar carry distance, 263. Then the Nikes were a bit lower, and then from then on, they all just um, drop off. And then the Callaway, um, the cheap Callaway one, I think it's called the Super Soft. I don't know. I don't play with those ones. I play with the Chrome Soft ones. The Super Soft ones, they carried very poorly, only 253 meters. And then the DT, which was, uh, that referred to, well, let me go back for a second. The DT was the Titleist True Soft, which is the cheapest one in the range of Titleists. That performed the worst out of all balls, only 250 meters per second. Oh, sorry, 250 meters carry distance. So what that shows is that the best Titleists, the Pro V1 and the Pro V1X, which are like a hundred dollars, hundred US dollars per dozen. Um, they are decent in terms of the carry distance, but not the best. But their cheapest one is the worst in terms of the carry distance. Now, I should mention here that the carry distance in terms of golf is not everything. It is when it comes to the driver, but other parts of the game is not everything. And this is where the difference with the Pro, Pro V1s come in. So the Pro V1s being the best, effectively the gold standard on the market, they've always had the best feel. At least that's what they advertise themselves as, themselves as in being uh, like the pro golfers ball. Uh, whereas the Bridgestones, I haven't played the Kirklands, but I'm guessing they're similar. Bridgestones, they usually feel like bricks. So they, like, I don't know if, where you are, but me and my friends, we call, like there's a perfection name called brick ball. So any ball that feels really bad, like you're hitting a brick, that's what you call them. And Bridgestones often come under those ones, at least the cheap ones. I don't know if this, this um, one, I don't think I've played with this one, but if you have a cheap ball, typically it doesn't feel very good, which means that you don't get a lot of feedback through the swing, which means that your body doesn't make very minor adjustments to be able to fine tune your swing as you're going through and you won't get um, the ball to perform as well. Uh, like you won't, you won't be able to control the ball as well. So even though the Pro V1s and the Nikes and the Callaways and even the uh, TaylorMades, they don't go as far as the cheaper balls, they will probably be marketing themselves as being better feel and in most cases they are so that's why people would still justify paying more for a ball that won't travel as far uh, because they can get better feel around the green on their short game and reduce their score that way so they take advantage of aerodynamics in a different way instead of reducing the drag they take advantage of the lift that it can be can be produced with these balls and also the side spins so looking at the trajectory this is really cool so they have the different trajectories and the tailor made has a bit of a flatter trajectory. So the maximum height that these balls go was about 23 and a half meters, which was the, both the Kirklands got that, no, maybe the Kirkland from 2016 got that. And the Wilson got that. The Kirkland from 2017 was actually had a lower trajectory by about a meter. And the tailor made had a low, lower trajectory again by about a meter. So the maximum height. And so the TaylorMade had a flatter shot, whereas the other ones had more of a loopy shot. So that's interesting. So finally, they say a low and medium priced bull 
had the longest carry distance, traveling further than all the top brand balls. So that's for driving. That's really good for um, the rest of the game. That may not be such a great idea. So in conclusion, they looked at different golf balls with their dimple patterns. They found that um, the cheap ones were the best in terms of the lowest drag. They also tested them in air instead of in a wind tunnel. So it replicated the results of a actual playing game almost perfectly. So that was a really novel way of looking at it. So in this podcast, make sure to like, subscribe. And if you want to make your experiments more accurate as we're talking about experiments here, make sure to measure the density of the air that you're using. The reason why that's important is because it changes by about 2 to 4% on a regular day. If you go to our website, you can look at uh, primarynarics.com. You can look at the density of air tab, and we have a podcast on there which goes through how the density of air changes on a regular day and how that changes the aerodynamics of and flow physics of a uh, bluff body and a streamlined body. And you'll be very surprised. So in, in conclusion, you need to measure the density of air. And we have an instrument called the Atmosphere Hawk that does that for you. It's very accurate and our clients love it. So the link is in the description and get one for yourself. And I'll see you next podcast. Peace out, amigos.